For the past few weeks, the gospel readings have been focused on the kingdom of heaven. And we've heard a whole series of parables. We continue that general theme today with the story of the feeding of the multitude. Because Jesus doesn't speak in this story directly about the kingdom, the connection may not be evident. But it is in the broader context of the story that the connection becomes clear. All four Gospels contain the stories of the Last Supper, Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, and the resurrection appearances. Beyond that, there are only a few stories that are common to all four Gospels. One of them is this story of Jesus feeding the multitude with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. That fact makes this a very important Gospel story indeed. All three accounts in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, share a common context. In each gospel, the feeding story follows the account of the death of John the Baptist. We do not hear these two stories read together in the liturgy, so it's easy to miss the connection between these two events. But I believe that they're intimately connected, and I'd like to explore together with you today a tale of two banquets. If you're not familiar with the death of the story of the death of the Baptist, here's an outline. Herod had John the Baptist arrested at the insistence of his brother's wife Herodias. She was offended that John was saying that Herod's relationship with her was improper because she was his brother's wife. At the banquet, Herodias' daughter Salome danced in such a way that Herod was moved to reward her by granting her a wish. Herodias asked Salome to ask for John's head on a platter. Although Herod was reluctant, he fulfilled his promise, and John was immediately executed and his head presented to Salome at the banquet table. Kind of messed up, as my granddaughter might say. Scripture scholar Scott Jose makes this comment. John the Baptist was the last great Old Testament prophet and the first great New Testament herald of the gospel. He is a unique figure, a pivotal figure, a figure very nearly without parallel in the history of redemption. And yet, he dies because of a stupid, senseless, lusty, and boozy blank check promise made by Herod to a young girl whose provocative dancing had clearly stirred him on more than one level. John literally loses his head on account of a drinking party gone awry and on account of his public scolding of Herod's uh, larger family for their equally public immorality. He gets killed not because he heralded Jesus as the Christ and not on account of some big cosmically vital theological issue, but on account of having ticked off the wrong people by pointing out the sordid and lurid nature of their lives. It doesn't make sense. So here you have the first of two banquets, a gathering of first century one percenters, the Judean A-listers. Two millennia later, we would have seen photos and breathless accounts of the scandal on the TV entertainment news shows. Meanwhile, John's disciples bring the news to Jesus. Jesus, filled with grief, retreats to the wilderness by boat but the crowds got word and followed him. They needed his words and the sense he made of their lives. These were not the A-listers from that crazy party. These were the nobodies, the last, the least, and the lost. Jesus felt compassion. His heart went out to the crowd. Despite his grief, his own need for solitude, Jesus went about the business of healing the sick and offering words of hope. As the day began to wane, Jesus' disciples wanted the people sent away to find food in the villages. But Jesus replied, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. At this, the disciples panicked. We only have five loaves and two fish. So Jesus said, well, bring them to me. Jesus took the loaves and the fish, raised his eyes to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and the disciples began to distribute them. Matthew tells us that the people began to eat, 
and they continued eating until all had eaten their full fill and there were 12 baskets of leftovers. No doubt, you have in your life heard some wonderful sermons about Jesus feeding the multitude. There are many different approaches to take. Clearly, the miracle of the multiplication of loaves and fishes, like the healing stories, are manifestation of Jesus' divinity and saving power, God's visitation to his people through him. I have heard good sermons about the possibility that when Jesus blessed, broke, and began to distribute this small amount of food, the people in the crowd were moved to open their own satchels and share the provisions they themselves had brought. The generosity of the gathered people resulted in an abundance that filled baskets of food when the crowd had eaten their fill. This is a powerful interpretation because Jesus' own faith exhibited the audacity of sharing a, ridiculous, a ridiculously small amount of food with a vast multitude is a lesson in trust. When we share what we have, especially if we are sharing from our own want and need, we are acting as Jesus acted. Every act of generosity is an act of trust. The feeding of the multitudes and Jesus' act action of blessing, breaking, and distributing prefigures the action of Eucharist in the Christian community, which blesses, breaks, and distributes bread that we understand as a sign, a sacrament of Jesus' abiding presence among us. All these interpretations are valid and meaningful when we look at the feeding of the multitude. But today, I want to briefly reflect on the broader context that makes this the tale of two banquets. I think that the contrast between Herod's party goers and the crowd that followed Jesus in the, world, in the wilderness is the significant point. On the one hand, we have the one percenters and on the other hand, we have the nobodies. On the one hand, we have the quest for pleasure that had no regard for human decency, excessive drinking, fueling, and exhibition of lust, resentment, and murder. And on the other, the crowd following Jesus into the desert out of their aching need, their humility, and their trust in Jesus. Here contrasted are two opposing images of what is important, what is human, and ultimately, what is good. We sitting here this morning fall somewhere squarely in the middle. We are not, neither the hyper-privileged, nor are we the destitute or teeter on the ragged edges of existence. We generally enjoy a much more secure life than did the people who came to hear and see Jesus in the desert. We can easily forget that our sense of security is illusory and it masks the reality of how tenuous and fragile life can be. But if you are anything like me, you live with the knowledge that our well-being can be shaken by a difficult conversation with our doctor or a layoff notice. The story of Jesus feeding the multitude is a reminder that we are really as dependent as the crowd, even when we don't recognize that fact. When the shelter in place began, I remember going to the grocery store and the surprise I felt when I got to the paper products aisle and found an acre or so of absolutely empty shelves. Fortunately, I didn't have bathroom tissue on my shopping list that day nor the next time. But the third week, I did have it on my list along with flour and soup and I came home with none of those things. I began to have a gnawing feeling of anxiety it was by no means a feeling of panic yet. I knew that the shortages were triggered by irrational hoarding and that it would all be resolved. But that whole thing triggered memories of my childhood growing up in a poor family. We were not hard scrapple poor. But as hard as my father worked, two jobs and occasionally three, ends did not always meet. There were just a couple of occasions which I will never forget. When my father told my brother and me that he and mom had already eaten, and my brother and I sat down alone at the table, eating and teasing and poking each other as we always did when we were unsupervised. I also remember the shock and shame I felt when later in my childhood, I realized that there were at least a few times when my parents did not eat so that my brother and I could. That memory is for me a touchstone. 
I believe that my awareness of my parents' sacrifices has been a strong motivator for me to work as hard as I could to preserve my own family's security. That awareness has driven me my entire adult life. I wonder sometimes about the words of the Lord's Prayer. We pray, give us this day our daily bread. I have not always felt what those words signify, that this is a prayer not so much of petition, but of acknowledgement of our dependence on God for our existence and all that sustains us. But these flashes of memory triggered by my reaction to shortages have brought an awareness and acknowledgement to the front of my mind. And I pray the Lord's Prayer and I read this tale of two banquets differently in light of our current COVIDity. We are more like the needy crowd sitting at the feet of Jesus than we may realize. I think this awareness is a manifestation of grace in my life. So I pray for myself and I bid you pray for yourselves as well that I and you will continue to be graced by this awareness and knowledge that I and you may continue to trust enough to be generous with those with whom we are, uh, with those things with which we are blessed, and that I and you will remember to always give thanks. Amen.